Johnson Oatman Jr. was born 1856 in New Jersey. He was from a very religious family. His father, Johnson Sr., had a great booming voice and was a talented magician. As a youngster, Johnson would sit by his father for hours, singing the great hymns of that time period. When he grew up, he became a minister in the Methodist Episcopal Church. Then at the age of 36, he felt that he needed to do something other than preach, so reflecting back on him being next to his father singing hymns, one night in 1892, Johnson Oatman took a pen, some paper, and attempted to write the lyrics of his first him. Within a few years, different churches everywhere were singing his hymns. In 1895, he wrote No Not One. In 1898, Higher Ground. In 1908, The Last Mile of the Way. He never saw songwriting as a financial venture, so he chose to only be paid one dollar for each song. And no doubt, his most famous lyrics came in 1897, Count Your Blessings. Now this hymn gained extremely favor in England. It was reported that in London, the men sang it, the boys whistled it, and the women rocked their babies to sleep by this hymn. Now the first three stanzas contrast a person dealing with their problems with a better choice would be in counting God's blessing. Then the fourth stanza is that God is overall and it concludes as the remedy for the three situations before as well as many others. On a sign outside a nursing home in Illinois were these words. Be grateful for small things big things, and everything in between. Count your blessings, not your problems. Brethren, do we spend more time counting our problems than counting our blessings? If so, that would probably explain why we are discouraged and miserably unhappy most or all the time. There is not a day that goes by, but what God does not bless us in more ways than we can possibly imagine. And sadly, many of us have often forgotten that. Now, in the first five verses of Psalms 103, which was read a little while ago, David gives himself a good talking to. He admits in verse 2 his own struggle to stay focused on God's blessing instead of his own problems. As he says in verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, now listen closely, and forget not all his benefits. Like David, we all tend to have a very short memory when it comes to remembering God's benefits or blessings. So David is reflecting upon all that his God the my shepherd of Psalms 23, verse 1, had done for him. Now it's my desire this morning in our message to remind us to count our blessings. And not just when we see the sun shining brightly above, but when dark clouds are looming overhead also. David composed this great psalm at a time most likely when his heart was filled with gratitude for the divine benefits that God had bestowed. And in these five verses, David reminds us of five wonderful blessings that we should be thankful for. And from each of these five favors flows an untold multitude of other blessings touching all aspects of our mortal lives. Now, as we understand the scope of these benefits, we will acknowledge that God is capable of satisfying every need in life. 
as David contemplated the benefits or provisions he received from God, his spirit was lifted. So let us consider this morning the great five provisions which are available from the provider in these five verses. The first provision that David recognized as being from God is an abundant forgiveness. This provision will be recognized by all who possess a sensitive spirit that comprehends sin's tragedy. Psalms 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Look at the first part of verse 3. Who pardons all your iniquities. Now I want you to imagine the unimaginable for just a moment. You've been arrested and charged with the heinous crime of murder. Now, after being held behind bars for many months and going through a lengthy trial, the guards uh, comes and takes you in shackles to the courtroom to learn your fate. The jury of your peer, peers files into the room after several days of deliberation. The assembly falls silent as the judge calls the court to order. He asked, Mrs. Foreman, Mr. Foreman, have you reached a verdict? Now your heart is pounding as you watch the jury foreman rise to his feet. The rest of your life hinges on the words that are about to come out of his mouth. Looking at the judge, he says, yes, Your Honor, we the jury find the defendant not guilty. Now a flood of relief sweeps over you and you begin to weep uncontrollably. The restraints are unlocked and you hear the judge kindly declare you are free to leave. Now slowly those words begin to sink in. You are free from condemnation. You are free from confinement. You are free to go home. You are free to begin a brand new life. And this is all because you've been released of the charges against you. Until you and I come to realize just how spiritually depraved we are without Jesus Christ, we can never fully understand or appreciate the forgiveness of God in removing our iniquity, in releasing us of our transgressions. Everything, absolutely nothing, is good in our sinful nature. We are marred by sin. Even at our very best, we are still miserable, wretched sinners. We fall short of perfection for the wages of sin is death Romans 6 verse 23 in fact we are so bad at one time you and I were on death row charged with the murder of Jesus God's son we were faced with spending an eternity in a painful prison called hell. There was absolutely nothing that we could do to save ourselves. But by His grace, God chose to pay the penalty of our sins by offering His own Son on the cross so that through the shedding of His precious blood, we might have the forgiveness of sin. And in the joyous day that we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior in obedience to his divine pattern of salvation, repentance, and water baptism, God pronounced on us not guilty. The forgiveness of God is never earned. It is a free gift bestowed by God's mercy. In the last part of Romans 6 verse 23. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We cannot buy our salvation. Forgiveness has already been purchased by the blood of Jesus. Because of sin, 
we are unable to find true joy. But God has provided the opportunity to receive pardon. Whenever this pardon is accepted, the sorrow of sin is replaced with the joy of salvation. Now, do we truly understand and appreciate just how blessed we are that God has forgiven us? God's forgiveness means that we have been set free from the guilt of sin. And that's what David tells us here in verse 3. Pardons all your iniquity. God's forgiveness means that we have been set free from eternal denunciation. Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God's forgiveness means that we have been also set free to enjoy the abundant life that only one receives from Jesus as he himself said I came that they may have life and might have it abundantly John 10 verse 10 because of the blessings of God's forgiveness you and I don't have to live like a condemned man or a woman anymore we don't have to survive under the tremendous burden of guilt and shame as if our conscience was chained to a heavy ball called sin that we daily drag around. We can face death and our eternal future with confidence and not fear. I'm reminded of the conversion of the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, verse 23 to verse 34. The jailer, he heard the gospel and learned about God's provision of salvation. He believed, repented, and was immersed in water. And after his baptism, he rejoiced greatly, having believed in God. Verse 34. The joy in the jailer's household that night is found every time those who hear the tender words they believe repent and are baptized for the forgiveness of their sins when one gives self to God he or she receives the provision of pardon now as David contemplated this provision he rejoiced in two great facts about God's forgiveness. First, it's completeness. David said, all iniquities can be pardoned. Secondly, it's reliability. Pardon is always available. It is unlimited, 1 John 1, verse 9. Fellow Christians, Jesus' blood continually washes us of all our sin. Let us be thankful for the blessings of God's forgiveness. Count your many blessings. Secondly, we have the provision of God's healing. Back to Psalms 103 verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. The last part of verse 3. Who heals all your diseases. If, God, uh, if David had recovered from a serious illness or witnessed a terrible tragedy, of, uh, tragedy averted, then the reference to the healing appears to be a physical curing from an ailment when David says, God heals all your diseases. Now Moses had told Israel long ago that if the Hebrew nation would remain faithful to God's commandments, that they would avoid all the diseases God had placed or put upon the Egyptians. Exodus 15, verse 26. So what does David mean when he says, who heals all your diseases? Is he saying that all of God's children are promised healing and full recovery from physical diseases? Life itself teaches us this is not true. All of us over the years have lost loved ones 
and friends to various diseases that plague our world. Even though we live in the post-miraculous New Testament first century age, we're to pray to God for help when we are ill. We cannot expect a New Testament miracle today, but we pray for the healing providence of God. So if we have ever been sick in the past, but are now healthy, give thanks to God. If the cancer of a loved one is in remission, give thanks to God. If we or a dear one nearly died in an accident, but survived, give thanks to God. The provision of a gracious God is good health. The Almighty has made available medical techniques and has given amazing knowledge for doctors to help us to recover from sickness. God has also provided a preventive manual that will guard us from immoralities and uncleanness which leads to various illness. This manual, the scriptures, supplies specific counsel to Christians following the Bible. We won't approach the evil practices which turn into harmful diseases. Yet millions suffer from cancer, heart disease, and other sicknesses that are not always due to one's sin. And not everyone gets those diseases. But sin is an epidemic, a deadly disease that affects every human being on earth without exception, even if they didn't live long enough to commit a sinful act, meaning the innocent young. As children, the sins of their parents, such as alcohol, drugs, and gambling, to name a few, affect young emotionally, physically, and Financially, that is why sin is the worst disease of all. No one is untouched by it. Every human anguish experienced on earth is somehow related to sin. God's word teaches us to deny all ungodliness and to walk in righteousness. Though paradise is lost, we can still have a better garden now. This morning, if you're a child of God, you have been healed of this dreadful disease. Now that does not mean that we're no longer sinners, but we are in remission from this deadly disease called sin. And that is because God has provided us with the only thing that will cure us, and that is the precious blood of his son, Jesus. What a wonderful, gracious provision that God has given to us from this spiritual disease called sin. Let us be thankful for the blessing of God's healing. Count your many blessings. Number three, we have a provision of God's redemption. Back to Psalms 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his blessings. The first part of verse 4. Who redeems your life from the pit or destruction. Now the word redeem has different meanings. One thought it is to be rescued from danger in a time of trouble. For example, Think of the unknown thousands of miles that you have driven over the course of your lifetime and not been involved in a fatal accident. Every year, thousands of people die in automobile collisions. But the fact that you are here this morning is proof that you are currently been redeemed from that deadly danger. Now this is certainly something to thank God for, is it not? 
Now, the word redeem also has a deeper spiritual meaning. To be redeemed means to be bought back. Now, it was a term that was used in slavery to describe the transaction where someone bought a slave from the owner and then set him free from servitude to that master. Now, none of us think of ourselves as slaves. But before accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that is exactly what we were. We were slaves to Satan. He had us in bondage to the life of sin. And his plan was to hold us hostage through our earthly existence and to destroy any hope of ever being set free to enjoy eternal life. We were in a hopeless situation. Nothing but devastation awaited us unless a great change comes. And only God provides the sufficient ransom that redeems our soul from Satan's snare. Christ redeemed us. He bought us back with his blood in order to set us free from eternal destruction so that we might have eternal life with him in heaven. This great redemption story is based is the basis for Old Testament scriptures up to its fulfillment in the death of Jesus and the benefits of his shed blood as seen in the New Testament, especially found in the conversions of the book of Acts. This redemption began as a distant hope spoken through the promise that was made in Eden against Satan. God speaking to the serpent. He shall bruise or crush you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Genesis 3 verse 15. It is the culmination of Calvary's cross and it's the reality of our present time. The psalmist expressed this hope in 103 verse 7 and 8. O Israel, hope in the Lord for with the Lord there is loving kindness and with him abundant redemption and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. An elderly widow prophetess named Anna, who spent many years in the temple, was there when Joseph and Mary brought baby Jesus. And looking upon the Christ child, it is said of Anna in Luke chapter 2, verse 38, giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him, that is Jesus, to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. This redemption was made possible by Christ's willing sacrifice. Jesus said in Matthew 20, verse 28, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This redemption is found only in the church which Jesus established. Titus 2, verse 14, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Now, who is this people? Acts 20, verse 28. The church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. This began in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, for those believing, repenting, and being baptized for the forgiveness of of their sins in Jesus' name. Let us be thankful for the blessings of God's redemption. Count your many blessings. Number four, we have the providence or provisions of God's loving kindness and tender mercies. Back to Psalms 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. The last part now of verse 4 who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion or tender mercies. Now notice the word crown. 
The provision of coronation enabled God's followers to enjoy the triumph of righteousness. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 20, verse 10. So the crown reminds us of our wonderful position as the children of God. As the Apostle John looked into heaven's splendor, he saw the four living creatures and the 24 elders join in chorus, praising God for having made Christians to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Revelation 5, verse 10. We are currently are doing that in his church or kingdom as priest. Now men seek honor, respect, and status. But only God can provide these blessings in, his in their truest forms. David knew the grandeur of an earthly monarchy, receiving worldly acclaim and the importance of a social status. But he also understood that a greater coronation was offered by the provisions of his almighty God. This crown also presents saints, that's us, as enjoying the precious attention of our great God and eternal King. To be crowned with loving kindness and compassion means that God knows our every weakness. He knows how difficult in life it is for us here. He knows how we're dealing with temptation and that we face many troubles. As David wrote still in Psalms 103, but now down in verse 10 and 11, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear or revere him. What they're saying is that God does not cast us aside when we fail. He never gives up on us. Instead, every single day, God crowns us with his loving kindness and compassion or tender mercies. Let us be thankful and let us count our many blessings. Finally, our fifth one is the provision of God's goodness as seen in contentment and strength. Back to Psalms 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Verse 5 who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The divine provision of contentment is marvelous. Men diligently search for this elusive blessing by trusting in worldly wisdom, earthly objectives, and fleeting dreams to no avail as there is nothing on earth that can satisfy us like God. Not money or materialism, not anything. The ungodly can never find genuine contentment because they are not trusting in God's provision. Paul writes to the brethren at Philippi, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. And then he ends it, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is chapter 3, verse 11 through 13. Paul accomplished this because he found strength in Christ. He knew that God's provisions would come to him when he faced trials. Paul was willing to trust his heavenly father to correct any situation over which the apostle had no control. In other words, Paul left it all in God's hands. God satisfies our needs with good things. And all that God provides 
for us is good. Only his good will brings about full satisfaction and peaceful contentment. The good things that David is describing does not and cannot come from anything that we visibly witness around us. Everything that we see and touch can only provide a short relief at best. Now I want you to think for a moment about your last Thanksgiving day. Now we each stuff ourselves until our bellies couldn't hold anymore. Now, you're sitting there smiling because you know I'm right. But then four or five hours later, we loaded up a plate of leftovers, and after zapping it in the microwave, we did it all again, filled to the gills. Why? Because the things of this earth can only satisfy us temporarily. We have to return to the table. But the good things of God can satisfy us for all eternity. His love, his joy, his peace, his grace, his mercy, and so much more. God desires to give us the good things if we will only be receptive to him. Moore Siegel was a Los Angeles street person. He slept outside, and he carried everything he owned in an old shopping cart. He died December 14, 1989 from natural causes and was found in an alley. But he was not the typical street person. He died with $207,421 in the bank. You see, 10 years earlier, his father died and left him this small fortune. But he never showed up to accept the money. Finally, the division of unclaimed property tracked him down, and he was given the money, which was put into a local bank. However, when he died, he only had $3 in his pocket and an untouched wealth in the bank. Now, we all agree that Morris's attitude in life appears to be crazy. But are there not many more people that we know that are even crazier? Long ago, God ratified the New Testament or will that provides us with a, 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 real, a lot more wealth than what Stiegel had. Now in Christ, we're having a tremendous inheritance both now and in the future. Future that is stored in a heavenly bank. Yet to this day, lost people, they shuffle around this world, walking up and down these alleys of sin, living lives of empty existence, refusing the wealth that God gave them. They reject Christ and an eternal inheritance. Still in verse 5, David considered the good consequence of provisions offered by God and concluded that they provide strength like the eagle, as an eagle is able to fly long and high. That is a symbol of action, victory, and vitality. The eagle epitomizes honor and power. One who shares in this strength will be able to soar above the trivialities of earthly life. And it's all from the provisions of God. The strength comes as a result of one being transformed by God's word. After dropping the burden of sin, youth is renewed and strength is found. It's like putting on new feathers. Paul observed that our old self was crucified with him, Romans 6, verse 6. And therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And that's what David is referring to as well as here in verse 5. When sin is vanquished by obedient faith, 
we find a renewal that gives great strength with a positive emotional state of mind. Cleanse conscience. Remember back in grade school as a student, you went to the chalkboard and you're writing down the wrong arithmetic answer or you're misspelling a word. And then you notice it and you need to make the correction. So what do you do? You take the eraser and you remove your mistake. Becoming a New Testament Christian, we get a new, fresh beginning. We get to wipe the slate clean. Let us be thankful for God's goodness and contentment and strength. Count your many blessings. If any of us are going to gain the full benefit of these divine provisions from our text, then we must do three things. First, we must praise God with all our being. Now back in Psalms 103, verse 1. All that is within me. Not half-hearted, but wholehearted. If we recognize God as the provider of all that we need in life, we must view this obligation or pra of praise as an essential act to our well-being. Secondly, we must adore God's holiness. Still in verse 1, His holy name. This refers to all that describes God. Man has a duty to admire God's character traits as well as God's work. By revering His holy name above all earthly names, we will always be aware of His holiness. And thirdly, we must remember God's blessing. Verse 2, and forget none of His benefits. The ingrate takes for granted the wonderful provisions of God. The worldly view of God's provisions are commonplace while ignoring their divine origin. Satan's deceitful effectiveness is causing our forgetfulness of God's blessings has been a constant snare for mankind to draw near to our Creator. If we cultivate a habit of thanksgiving and praise for all that God has provided, we will not forget him. Around 2 a.m. on September 8, 1860, the steamboat Lady Elgin collided with the schooner Augustus in Lake Michigan, near Waukegan, Illinois, which is just north of Chicago. Now, the Lady Elgin carried more than 300 passengers and crew, suffered tremendous damage. Most of the victims held out to floating debris and clutched small pieces of wreckage in the long hours during this in the cold lake. Now most of the passengers and crew died that night, 279. However, 17 people were saved by a Northwestern University student named Edward Spencer. As an excellent swimmer, he would grab a weakened passenger, pulling him to the shore, then another and another. Finally, after six hours in the frigid water, having reached the limits of his strength, his body covered with scrapes and bruises, Spencer collapsing and under exhaustion, passed out on the shore. Now, as a result of this ordeal, he was unable to finish his school studies. The physical and emotional toll had been too severe on him. His health was permanently damaged and he was well a wheelchair bound for the rest of his time dying in 1917. Now later in life, he said with tearful eyes, not one of those rescued ever came back and even said, thank you. Though he undoubtedly did not rescue them in order to earn their gratitude, it is a sad commentary on our frequent 
failure in this human area of common sense. In being thankful. Let us always daily be grateful to one another and to our God. Now let me close by asking a serious question. Does God fail to provide for any need in our life? Or does he overlook some area? Now speaking for all of us, I have to answer no. God the provider has seen that gracious blessings are available for every need in our lives. Now I said needs, not wants. Wants, as that can be a whole world of difference. I'm in complete agreement with the Apostle Paul. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, verse 19. Understanding this should cause a dramatic change in our lives. We serve God the provider of all the wonderful blessings. Surely we will not forget any of his benefits. And we will bless his holy name in praise and service. Now we begin this morning by serving him as his child. However, if not one already, then start in repentance and water baptism for the pardon of your sins if you need to come forward. So let us count our many blessings as together we stand and as we sing.